Committee of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund to order and welcome everyone in attendance. My name is Garth Rosal, MLA for Vermilion Lloyd Minister Wainwright and Chair of this committee. I'd ask the members and those joining the committee at the table to introduce themselves for the record and then I will call on those joining by the video conference um, and we'll get, begin to my right. Uh, good morning, my name is David Egan. I'm the MLA for Edmonton Northwest. And good morning, uh, Christina Gray, MLA for Edmonton Mill Woods. Good morning, everyone. Sandra Lau, co-CIO, AIMCO. Good morning, all. Amit Prakash, Chief Fiduciary Management Officer, AIMCO. Good morning, Nelson Roby from with the Office of the Auditor General. Good morning, Brad Ireland from the Auditor General's Office. Good morning, I'm Trafton Koenig with the Parliamentary Council Office. Good morning, Nancy Robert, Clerk of Journals and Committees. Good morning, Warren Huffman, Committee Clerk. Did you get to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jones, um, Treasurer Board and Finance. Okay, thank you. And uh, on, uh, on the uh, teams, we've got, uh, we'll start with Dan Williams. Dan Williams, member of the legislature for Peace River. I am in my constituency with poor connectivity, so if I don't turn on my camera when I speak, I apologize. Okay, thank you. Uh, MLA Singh. Good morning, everyone. Peter Singh, MLA Calgary East. Thank you. MLA Allard. Good morning, everyone. MLA Allard uh, for Grand Prairie. MLA Hunter. Good morning, Grant Hunter, MLA for Taper Warner. I think that's got all of us. Janet Laurie was one. Oh, um, and uh, Janet Laurie. Oh, you're on mute there. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair. Janet Laurie, Communications with the Legislative Assembly Office. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'd, I will note the following substitutions. We have MLA Williams for MLA Jones and MLA Allard, Allard will be uh, Deputy Chair. A uh, few housekeeping items to uh, address before we turn to business at hand. Please note that the microphones are operated by Hansard staff. Mm -hmm. Committee proceedings are a live stream on the internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. The audio and video stream transcripts of the meeting can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. Members participating remotely are encouraged to have your camera on while speaking and please mute your microphones when not speaking. Remote participants who wish to be placed on speaker list are asked to email or send uh, a message in the Teams chat to the committee clerk and members in the room are asked to please signal the chair or committee clerk. Please set your phones on uh, mute and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. Now we just had uh, Mr. App come in if you could introduce yourself please. My apologies, Mr. No, Chair. Okay. Yeah. Lowell Epp, Assistant Deputy Minister, Treasury Board and Finance. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll go for approval of the agenda. Are there any changes or additions to the draft agenda? If not, would someone like to make a motion to approve the agenda? MLA uh, Egan? Any discussion? Oh, seconder, I guess. Uh, don't need, need that. Perfect, okay. Um, any discussion on that? All in favor? Uh, in, the, in here? Okay. All in favor on the uh, online? Okay, Aye. Okay. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed anywhere? Say nay. That is passed. Um, approval of minutes. Honorable members, we have the minutes of our last meeting on May 30th, 2022 to review. Are there any errors or omissions to note? not, would a member like to make a motion to approve the minutes? MLA Gray. Uh, all in the room in favor, please say aye. Uh, do I need a seconder for that? No, no, apparently not. Uh, uh, yeah. Aye, okay. <laughs> uh, anyone on line in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, any, aye. Op any opposed, see, any, anywhere, please say nay. <coughs> okay, that is approved. Okay, <clears throat> honorable members, we now turn to the 2021-22 annual report of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund. The committee clerk received a draft of the annual report from Treasury Board of Finance 
on June 22nd. That report was made available to the committee members on the internal website. I'll note for everyone's information that this report is confidential, confidential until it is approved by the committee. Before we hear from our guests, I would like to briefly review the committee's mandate with respect to the fund's annual report. As stated in Section 6-4B of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund Act, one of the functions of this committee is to approve the fund's annual report. Furthermore, Section 16-2 of the Act requires the committee to review and approve the report furnished copies to the clerk and all members of the Legislative Assembly on or before June 30th, after which the report shall be made public. At this time, the Treasury Board and Finance officials will provide an overview of the annual report, followed by remarks from AMCO, and then we will open the floor to questions from committee members. So, carry on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, certainly my pleasure to be here and good to see you all again. Uh, I'm very pleased to tell you that uh, this year, uh, at the close of this year, the Heritage Fund uh, recorded its highest value ever at $18.7 billion. Uh, the $18.7 billion is made up of uh, $20 billion in assets or investments at, uh, uh, under management and uh, $1.2 billion uh, to be paid to the general revenue fund in due course uh, from last year's earnings. In addition, the fund has in, uh, the earned positive net income in 13 consecutive years since 2008-09, uh, and markets have had a, a very good run during that time. Uh, the market value loss uh, that we saw in 2019-20 as a result of the pandemic was quickly reversed, and uh, during that year, even though the fund lost value, we still earned about $1.2 in investment income. Over the last five years, the Heritage Fund has earned an annualized market value return of 7.6%. This return is 1.2% above the fund's longstanding target return of inflation plus 4.5%. This is measured over a five-year period. So, uh, I think I missed something. No. So, uh, the return from active management investments over the last five years has added 0.4% in value versus the passive benchmark. This, 0 .6%, this is 0.6% below the fund's aggressive target to earn an annualized 1% return from active management, again, over a five-year period. In terms of investment income, the fund has earned $7.3 billion in the last five years, $1.6 billion of which has been retained by the fund for inflation proofing and, of course, helped it hit its record high value. The one-year performance numbers show that the fund had an excellent year in 21-22, earning a market value return of 11.8%. This return is lower than the 14.5% that we reported after three quarters, but unfortunately, a number of events, market and otherwise, such as inflation, uh, concerns, rising interest rates, the war in Ukraine, and rising energy prices that have resulted uh, had a negative impact on the markets. Uh, the fund's value declined by about 2.3% during the final quarter. But all things considered, uh, earning an 11.8% return is a very good year, for, or a very good return for 20. 21-22. This is particularly true when compared to the uh, passive benchmark for the fund. The benchmark return on the fund was 6.6%. In other words, the value added through active management was 5.2%. Net investment income for the fiscal year was a little under $2 billion, the fourth, fourth highest level in history and the highest amount in the last five years. Due to higher inflation, the fund will retain more of this income to inflate, for inflation proofing. That amount is $705 million. This is the large, largest inflation proofing amount uh, since inflation proofing <coughs> began in 2005-06. As typically is the case, 
the return from equity investments was the best among the three primary asset classes. Equities earned 18.4% over the year, a return that was 9% higher than the benchmark return of 9.4%. The most significant contributor to both returns and value added with the equities asset class came from private equities. Private equities earned an incredible return of 37.1%, 28.1% higher than its benchmark. Inflation sensitive and alternative assets earned a return of 15% during the fiscal year versus a benchmark return of 9.3%. Renewable resources had the strongest return among these, uh, the asset subclasses, but real estate and infrastructure investments also posted double digit returns. Fixed income returns were not so good. Uh, they were negative due to rising interest rates and inflation fears. Uh, the fund's fixed income portfolio lost 2.2% during the year, which is 1.1% better than the negative 3.3% benchmark return. Over the last five years, equities have performed the best, which we would expect, with a return of 10.4%. Uh, this is followed by inflation sensitive and alternative assets at 6% and fixed income assets at 2.8%. In closing, uh, although the Heritage Fund is often ignored and many Albertans don't even know that it exists, it has made an important contribution to the province's finances. Over the last 46 years, it has transferred $47 billion in uh, investment earnings to government and government priorities. And uh, we are very fortunate to have this fund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. We'll carry on with April, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, all. We are really pleased uh, to be here in person um, and sharing our um, uh, insights and um, um, outlook with you. I will start uh, my prepared remarks uh, giving the committee an update uh, on on the organization and followed by my colleague Sandra who will review performance, describe uh, the drivers of that performance and as well as uh, provide a market outlook. So in terms of the, the organization, the, uh, in terms of AIMCO, um, the first thing uh, I wanted to start with is we shared with you that late last year and going into early part of the year, we had reviewed and refreshed uh, our corporate strategy. Uh, this is a strategy that, uh, that, that looks uh, out over the next five years, and a centerpiece uh, of that strategy uh, was the need for us to become a more client-focused, a client-centric organization. And uh, a big component uh, of that uh, is uh, the ability that we deliver consistent, reliable uh, service to our clients and as well as uh, uh, earn and retain the trust of our clients. So in that, uh, in that space, so some of the things that we've been doing uh, that, uh, that we thought would be helpful for the committee to share with the committee. So first and foremost, we've spent uh, a lot of time with our clients uh, better understanding the investment uh, needs and objectives and reaffirming um, uh, some of the, the more detailed uh, requirements uh, around risk tolerance, around risk preferences, uh, around excess return targets, etc. So that, that is simply around the thesis that better we know, better job we would do in delivering uh, to those uh, requirements. A couple of other things of note, so uh, we've established uh, working uh, forums where we interact with the clients both at the strategic level as well as more granular topics and that's something uh, that's been going on for the last six months. And then lastly, uh, we've been engaged in uh, with our clients on a whole host of consultations. Uh, both to provide visibility into clients in terms of how we're approaching topics as well as soliciting the input and ultimately being transparent in terms of how we operate. Uh, some of the, the outcome of the, this consultation has led to 
a revamp of our equity offerings, and that is something that is ongoing. It will improve the choice that the clients have, such as yourselves, uh, as well as improve uh, and as well as simplify uh, our platform. Um, so equities is first, fixed income is behind. There are a couple of uh, other strategies we're engaging with clients on and review of uh, uh, benchmarks. Uh, we've been on this journey, if you will, on this renewed journey for the last uh, uh, six plus months. And therefore, we also sent a client survey out to just gauge and solicit feedback specifically on uh, on how we're doing and, and getting a sense from our clients with which pieces are working, which pieces are not working. So happy to report that all of our clients, 100% of the clients uh, responded. 84% uh, of the responses said to the question whether we're headed in the right direction and would these changes lead to better service and support for our clients, 84% uh, said yes uh, and rated as seven or above on a scale of one to 10. So certainly encouraged by that. Uh, there are areas uh, that we need to get a lot better at, and included in that is risk reporting, uh, timeliness of some of the information that we provide to our clients, and as well as portions of our responsible investment or ESG reporting. So we're very committed to working with our clients on improving, uh, improving in the areas that they've reflected, as well as building upon the areas uh, that, uh, that we're doing well. Two other, uh, two other things, uh, so with the uh, lim uh, lifting of the restrictions uh, of the pandemic, so like many other organizations, we uh, are also uh, heading uh, or have headed back, are heading back, uh, back to the office. Uh, we're encouraging employees to be in the office uh, twice a week. Um, and in plus, uh, there are obviously times when they, we would ask them to come in for group events, uh, 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 corporate-wide uh, meetings, uh, etc. We've also taken the opportunity to implement uh, uh, what we refer to as a results-only work environment, and this effectively is a way uh, is, is a system that places a lot of autonomy and authority with the employees in terms of how they operate. And the idea being that this leads to a better engaged and more productive uh, uh, team, uh, as well as allows us to uh, attract and retain talent, uh, which is in a market which is uh, very uh, competitive. And lastly, uh, a quick update on the executive hiring. So. Uh, later, over the next couple of weeks, the last of the, the executive hires would be complete. So we will have the entire roster of the executive team in place. The more recent hires include the chief technology officer, uh, the head of real estate, and as I mentioned, the head of uh, human resources will join us in the next couple of weeks. With that, I will turn it over to Sandra for her uh, remarks. Sandra. Thank you. Thanks, Ahmed. Hi everyone, really pleased to be here to meet all of you in person after uh, two years and uh, pleased to report back the uh, performance of the Heritage Trust Fund uh, for the physical year end of March 2022. Like Lo mentioned, the fund earned a very strong return of 11.8%, outstanding, uh, outperforming the uh, passive benchmark by close to 5.2%. Despite a very challenging economic backdrop that presented itself during the last quarter of the physical year. Over the last five years, the fund actually uh, delivered an annualized return of 7.6%. Over the last 10 years, an annualized return of 9.3%, both outperforming the benchmark of uh, 40 basis point and 60 basis point respectively. I will, I will comment that for the most of the physical year, the effect of pandemic, inflation, central bank policy continues to play out in the background. However, most of the significant event actually occurred in the last quarter of the uh, uh, physical year. Russia and Ukraine situation, continuous high inflation concern, China's zero COVID policy, and especially with the accompany of the uh, central bank uh, higher interest rate policy all led to a lower market return in the last quarter of the physical year. 
With that backdrop, yet the fund finished up with a very strong year of a strong positive return. And I would say all the asset class of AIMCO contributing to this strong total return and relative return. In terms of fixed income, interest rate actually went higher in the second half of the physical year. 10-year government bond yield went from 1.5% to 2.5% within six months. Rising interest rate will, of course, lead to a negative return of a fixed income benchmark, leading to a minus 2.2%. However, the fixed income asset class actually outperformed the benchmark by 1% because of our discipline approach of being short in duration, being focused on focusing on higher quality investment grade uh, credit in terms of public credit, private debt and loan, and private mortgages. Like Lowe mentioned, the biggest uh, uh, contribution of the total return is equity as a class. The public equity and private equity jointly are generating a return of 18.4% return, outperforming the benchmark of close to uh, uh, 10%. <laughs> despite the market disruption that I talked about earlier on during the last quarter. This is resulting from the strong overall uh, market performance most part of the year, and also with the team approach again of the discipline of investing, uh, with the public equity focus on value, uh, strong growth, uh, value and strong quality stock over growth, and also focusing on the uh, 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 actively managing the portfolio despite of the market sell off during the last quarter. The other highlight is our private equity portfolio. Um, the private equity portfolio outperformed the benchmark by close to 28%, delivering a 37% of a return. This is more due to the, um, uh, uh, the asset valuation uh, uh, of the uh, private equity, also because of the active access, access strategy of our private equity portfolio. One of the good example is one of the uh, investment that we have is called Haywood. It's a century old um, uh, uh, commercial and residential swimming pool company. Um, they are the global designer, manufacturer, and marketer of a, a broad portfolio of pool equipment and associated uh, automation system. The asset we invest for five years, and with the COVID situation and work from home, it's actually give a good lift for the asset itself. The asset went to IPO, giving the uh, asset a five times multiple of a return with a five years holding period for our client. In terms of inflation sensitive asset, which is mostly on the real estate and infrastructure, continues to do well with a double digit return. Um, most of the uh, value add of the infrastructure coming from the resilient of the asset that we have, such as transportation, utility during the pandemic, and also extreme strong demand for this type of asset class um, and uh, 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 over, over the last couple of years. Real return, uh, real, uh, real estate continues to do very well, given the team proactively managed the asset um, even before COVID. The team has been very focused on adding into industrial, logistic, alternative strategies such as data center and life science. So all contribute to the uh, good return of the, uh, the program. So in terms of market outlook, the first half of the, uh, the, uh, the year has been difficult for a lot of investors. The six months of the time, we saw negative benchmark return for stock and bonds, which is very unusual. Usually in a normal time, stock and bonds return will move in the uh, opposite direction. This more reflect the concern of the aggressive uh, uh, central bank action and also the market and rising concern of a recession coming our way. As recent as uh, two weeks ago, we saw US CPI sitting at a high level at 8.6%, 40 years high that we ever seen. A week after, the Federal uh, Reserve came with a 75 basis point one-time interest rate hike. The last time the Fed Central Bank did it was actually in 1994 with a 75 basis point hike. So this is uh, 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 the biggest concern and risk coming our way is still is inflation and policy era. Too little of the uh, central bank policy is a risk of inflation running too high. Too aggressive of the central bank policy will leading to a recession in which market is continuous pricing in for this type of risk, both we see in the market and also in the equity market. 
Geopolitical concern continues to be a risk over a short and medium term, which will add more risk to inflation and market volatility. So the volatility of a market and how the market unfold is basically data dependent, depends on the inflation data that we will be seeing. AIMCO team has continues to be a laser focus on managing and mitigating this type of risk by focusing on diversification of the asset class, our strategy, prudent underwriting process, stress testing our portfolio, and continuous revising our thesis and our theme. And last but not least, this type of market uh, uh, challenge a lot of time only present good opportunity. As such, we are having a very disciplined approach to maintain good liquidity for our client that we are ready to react when opportunity present themselves. So that will conclude my uh, presentation. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for your presentations and all that. Uh that information. Oh, yeah, I'll do it, yeah. Uh, if we can, um, I've noticed uh, MLA Rain has uh, joined the meeting online, so if you want to introduce yourself, please. And, uh, MLA Pat Rain for MLA for Lesser Slave Lake. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so what we'll do is, uh, we're going to ask questions and we'll go back and forth uh, between the, the two sides here and we'll wrap up close to 930 and, uh, and because we got other business to deal with uh, in between. 1030. Uh, what am I saying? Sorry. 1030. <laughs> That'd be a quick one. <laughs> yeah, quick question, yes. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, we'll start with MLA Hunter and then we'll go to MLA Egan and then to MLA Allard. Is MLA Hunter available? Can you hear me? Yeah, can now, yeah. Sorry, my internet is a little spotty today. I'm not sure why either, but um, I don't. I can't turn on my camera. Is that okay, Mr. Chair? It's, yeah, we'll have to go with that, Chair. Okay. Um, so I guess my first question, um, I, I, first of all, I'm pleased to see the gross investment earnings was $948 million higher than estimated in budget 2021. But I wanted to know what what factors would you say made it possible for the fund to outperform the uh, expectations this year? I think there are the all the factors that I described uh, earlier for the uh, for for this year. Is it the question asking for this year how the fund will outperform or last year attribution? The 2021. 2021. So is the all the other factors that we described earlier for each of the asset class actually outperform significantly for the uh, uh, for versus the benchmark of performance? Uh, fixed income outperform uh, because of our short duration bias and also on our uh, focus on high quality credit on each of the asset class. Um, public equity outperform significantly because of the discipline approach on how we manage our, uh, our stock portfolio, uh, proactively focus on the value and the quality stock, stay away from technology and growth stock. Private equity, we have a good return because of the asset we own and also the exit of some of the asset that we have, such as Haywood, ERM, and also having a good result. Infrastructure program, uh, we have a good uh, uh, valuation uh, uplift from the pandemic from 2020 uh, 20 and 21. So that's give us a very good valuation. And also we have a couple of the asset classes that uh, for especially in infra, because of the high demand of this asset, the valuation continues to improve, giving us a very positive performance. Last but not least, real estate. Real estate actually outperforms because of the team proactively uh, ahead of the curve and uh, identify a lot of uh, uh, good alternative asset classes. Stay away from retail, office, pre-COVID, and more heavily investing in industrial, logistic, identified alternative strategies such as data center, health, uh, health science. All this is actually contributing to very good performance and relative outperformance of the portfolio relative to the benchmark. I'll add uh, just one more remark. So outside of uh, the the our uh, performance details that Sandra provided. One of the things that makes uh, portfolios such as yours resilient is the design of the portfolio. And that's really hard to do last minute. So the fact that you have exposure to private equity, the fact that you have exposure to uh, private debt and loan, 
inherently uh, makes uh, makes the portfolio much more balanced, and therefore, when these opportunities arise, you know that gets reflected in performance. Thank you. You have a follow up or right. a second thank question? Yeah. Thank yeah. Thank you. First of all, I, I wanted to say uh, I do appreciate that you're um, getting those higher returns um, for our for your clients and for Alberta Albertans. Um, I know that uh, my own RSPs didn't perform that well, so I, I do appreciate that you guys are doing as well as you are. Um, now, I see on page 10 of the annual report that the funds investment expenses were $9 million higher than the previous year. What would you say were the main factors that contributed to such a difference? Um, I can address that. Um, so actually, in addition to attracting and retain our own talent of the investment professional within our team, uh, INCO actually have a lot of good partnership in terms of external manager uh, 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 partnership out there. They are best in class that help us to source asset and manage in an asset and external manager relationship that we have. This will give us the benefit for some of the asset class to tap on the, uh, the uh, area that we have uh, less exposure to and provide us the, the good skill set from the external manager and having exposure to uh, some of the opportunity. So on the cost front, and this is more related to the outperformance of the external manager, uh, more reflected with the strong performance they bring to the table, the performance you're seeing from the Heritage Trust, Trust Fund is actually net of all the fee. So all the cost related to that is the uh, a majority of it is the, uh, 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 the management fee because of the strong performance that the manager brought to the table. So the nine million is related to that. And I would uh, take your attention to actually translate to the basis point. If we compare of the 2020 and 21 number, the investment expense ratio is more or less the same at 90 basis point. So that's reflect that this fee is only being paid to the manager only if they outperform. So it's only on the performance based uh, variable fee that uh, leading to the increase of $9 million. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, MLA Hunter. Uh, just to, uh, on the process of this, we'll have the initial question and then a follow-up, and then we'll continue on like that. So next we go to MLA again. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to both TBF and INCO for your fulsome uh, reports. Um, my question um, is in regards to the uh, something that I brought up in the last meeting of the committee, and I, I asked uh, Treasury Board and Finance um, a, a number of questions related to... Um, cryptocurrency and the government's position on cryptocurrency. So that was on May 30th, um, and um, it was the committee's expectation that uh, we would get a response uh, within 30 days. So I know it's two days before that, but um, just about to hit the deadline, I my, my first question would be then to TBF, um, if uh, you are preparing uh, the committee uh, answers to those questions, and uh, when... Um, uh, are you planning to give us that information or could you give it to us now? Well, we are preparing a return or uh, an answer, pardon me, a response. Um, we don't have it ready quite yet and we hope to pr produce it within the next couple of days. Okay, um, that would that would be great. Um, I'm just curious then uh, when I did ask the questions, of course we had um, another of uh, uh, finance minister and uh, now of course we have a, an interim finance uh, minister so um, I'm just curious as you were uh, gathering your responses uh, that we'll get in the next couple of days which is great um, I'm just curious to uh, know if there was um, any change in regards to the position um, of the government uh, around uh, cryptocurrency from uh, the previous uh, finance minister and uh, um, I just would like to know when we do get the response in the next couple of days, if this will be a response that uh, reflects the previous minister's uh, position or the new minister's position. Uh, the response uh, will reflect the new minister's position. And uh, uh, I think you asked uh, something else about... Uh, um, yeah, no, that's that's fine. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to MLA Alar. 
Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to everyone for your excellent presentations. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions regarding inflation. Seeing that inflation is um, a very prevalent topic in financial markets today, and certainly, um, as mentioned in your presentation, is impacting returns that we're seeing, although I did hear some inflation proofing planning on the on the part of AIMCO, and so thank you for that. I just wanted to, for the benefit of Albertans, ask a little bit more about what your strategy is to inflation proof the fund. I heard you talk about uh, not being in, in retail as much and going into larger industrial projects, if I heard that correctly. And uh, do you see any challenges to your inflation proofing plan given the supply chain issues and the economic recovery with COVID? That's my first question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sure, I can, I can address that. A um, couple area of addressing inflation, of course, is starting with the asset mix, in which the Heritage Trust Fund have a very strong asset mix of allocating inflation-sensitive asset, which is mostly infrastructure and real estate portfolio. So those assets have the benefit of uh, uh, um, hedging inflation, and especially on infrastructure, it's more on the uh, utility and also transportation and some of the energy related supported by highly regulated business and contract model that the inflation uh, cost and the inflation is, is being hedged strongly in the infrastructure asset. Similarly, for real estate of diversified pool of real estate portfolio on any uh, uh, sectors such as industrial, uh, retail, uh, um, uh, uh, multi-unit uh, uh, residential, those, especially with the rent, is being able to reflect the inflation changes. In, uh, real estate continues to be a very strong uh, asset class of inflation hedge in general. So the two, those two asset class provide a strong hedge for the uh, inflation uh, of the fund. Now, the second derivative of inflation, then it's, it's high inflation leading to high interest rate and more uh, volatility in the uh, other risk assets such as stocks and other risk assets that we have. So the second derivative of, of managing that is number one, prudently managing the interest rate risk because high inflation usually mean more aggressive central bank policy leading to high interest rate. So INCO has been uh, uh, very prudently uh, managing the interest rate risk, uh, fixed income portfolio more focusing on shorter interest rate, floating rate notes to hedge away the interest rate risk because of inflation, uh, risk assets such as uh, public equity, um, because potentially high interest rate leading to maybe a sell-off and revaluation of the risk asset. As such, we are very uh, mindful and careful to manage that second derivative of inflation leading, impacting the portfolio of, of being short in duration and more uh, uh, careful and cautious on how we invest in the public equity portfolio. And also on the uh, total technical level, we are always mindful being uh, underweight in bond and underweight in stock as we go into the inflation cycle. So all those management come from the higher level of portfolio diversification, the active management of the asset mix, and last but not least, how we prudently managing each of the asset class with the inflation backdrop in mind. And this thesis continues to be stress test. Our risk team has been continuously helping us and stress test the portfolio of different scenario to see the outcome. And this theme and thesis continues to be uh, re-evaluated re re on a regular basis. Perfect. Thank you. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, inflation is top of mind, certainly for constituents in my in my area of the province. And, and I would say for economists the, the world over right now, I notice in the fund there's about 30.8% of the assets that are inflation sensitive, as you mentioned in your presentation. And there's also alternative investments there. I'm just wondering if you can provide an overview of some of the alternative investments contained in this category. And also with respect Respect to your comments around continuously reviewing your policy um, and your investment strategies on inflation. If you can speak a little bit to the potential for stagflation and what is the plan for the fund if we get into that situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your answer in advance. Sure. Um, 
Going to your first question, a liquid asset class or alternative asset is exactly to the inflation sensitive asset class that I point to. Real estate, renewable resources, those are the two asset class I was referring to. Um, the return on this asset expect, ex, ex, uh, expected to outperform with an inflationary environment given the re revenue stream that are closely correlated with inflation. And um, Infrastructure, again, they are uh, long-term uh, equity-oriented position in asset class that are high barrier to entry uh, with a regulated return, long-term contract that provide a, a good inflation. Again, real estate portfolio, like I said before, like given you a diversified of the sectors mix and geographic uh, exposure, we actually have real estate portfolio uh, in different uh, uh, sectors and also in di uh, different geographic region, such as UK, Europe, and US. So this type of diversification within the portfolio itself, not only giving you uh, in uh, inflation protection, but also is a diversification of different Inflation in different country, giving you a diversification asset on the uh, strategy investment. So that's what we have on the um, on the uh, on the on the asset side. Now on the next question on stagflation. I guess deflation on, 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 the, on the process you are referring to. Um, the team has continuously been uh, 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 analyzing um, the, the latest development and uh, consistently underwriting this thesis because market is constantly changing. I remember uh, six, nine months ago, we were just talking about inflation and maybe stagflation. Now the concern is less of a stagflation. The concern is more about recession. So the team continuously reevaluated the changes in economics backdrop of this type of changes in the market and rewrite our thesis and position ourselves accordingly. Probably the most of the positioning coming from the mix is in stock and bonds. Be given they are in the uh, public market, we are more nimble and flexible. If we need to constantly adjust the asset mix, prudently putting some hedges on to protect and further protect the portfolio. So those are the constant uh, evolving process that we assess our portfolio day in, day out. Um, the portfolio is constantly stressed every day with the risk team and, and look at the risk that we have. And uh, this is all into consideration as we uh, manage a portfolio every day. Okay, thank you. Our next question will come from MLA Gray. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's good to see you in person uh, for this meeting. Certainly, we've talked at length at this committee about uh, AIMCO's performance and the performance expectations, uh, including talking about our, our passive benchmarks and our active benchmarks uh, a number of times. Uh, so our expectation is that uh, AIMCO will beat the bench passive benchmark by 1%. Over the past five years, uh, you're at 40 basis points over the benchmark, and over the last 10 years, you're at 60, so not hitting that mark. Um, so the organization is, is falling short of those expectations. Certainly this current, what we have in this fiscal year is, is different from that, um, but we are looking at, at long-term goals, and of course, uh, the fees we are paying that, that Mr. Hunter was, was asking about uh, is for the benefit of that active management. Um, and so my, my question is just around, given the risk profile of the Heritage Savings Trust Fund, um, why would you say we are not hitting uh, the active management targets that have been set? Uh, and do you see those active management targets as being realistic? Because I noted during his report, Mr. Epp uh, referred to it as an aggressive target. Uh, but my understanding is that this is a target that's been committed to uh, a number of times. Uh, is it a reasonably set target? Thank you, uh, thank you for uh, for that question. Um, we invest on your behalf over the long long term, mm -hmm. and and uh, the the expectation and objective is that we will meet both the the uh, the excess return target as well as uh, deliver uh, the market return uh, in addition to the excess return. Uh, consistent with the exposures uh, that you and other clients uh, seek, uh, and particularly as you as you correctly sort of pointed out, you know the, the you do one does need a longer horizon for that for those numbers, uh, for those numbers uh, uh, to be achieved. 
given what we've had and literally coming through the pandemic and, and, and now the geopolitical issues, the, the impact on performance, particularly over windows, uh, shorter windows, uh, is, uh, you know, can be challenging. Having said that, over longer periods of time, um, you know, one would, uh, one would, uh, one is confident that one could achieve that over time. In terms of how aggressive uh, this is, um, uh, if you want to speak to that level, um, I can certainly speak to it. Uh, we uh, we set the target way back in 2007 for 2008. And the target was based on a consultant's report that said a privatized AIMCO could uh, deliver 200 points of value added. Um, we are a little skeptical. Uh, and we, uh, we set it at 100 basis points. We know it's aggressive. You know, looking back historically, uh, it is aggressive. But uh, we we believe that continuing to push uh, for a high, uh, continuing to push a high target is better than uh, a lower target. Thank you for that, and I I agree based on the conversations that I'm having uh, within uh, the investment community uh, that the funds target that returns be at least 1% higher than the returns of a passive managed portfolio given the risk profile for the Heritage Savings Trust Fund uh, is, is a good one. Um, my follow-up question would be, what analysis AIMCO does relative to competitors uh, within kind of this risk profile group to compare um, performance and, and how the Heritage Savings Trust Fund is, is measuring up when it comes to beating the benchmark. Um, who are the Heritage Savings Trust Fund competitors or, or um, maybe not even competitors but just uh, similar products in the, in the market uh, that you look to uh, when we're evaluating our own performance, uh, and uh, are you are there relevant metrics you can share with the committee? So we, we look at institutional pools of capital, comparable, so not not certainly not identical, but similar institutional pools of capital, and recognize that when we do this comparison, uh, different uh, policy mix, different yeah. implementation, etc. So there's a lot of noise. But having said that, at a, at a high level, we we look at that on a regular basis. We report it uh, to our board uh, as well. And so we are cognizant uh, of uh, those, uh, those comparatives. But uh, equally and perhaps more importantly, when we are doing this comparison, we're also looking to see if there are certain ideas, certain exposures that you know we should be looking at that you know that we don't have uh, in our uh, in our toolkit if you will and so you know just to just by way of a bit of a walk down uh, 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 memory lane so to speak uh, the addition of product uh, private debt and loan was uh, you know came off one of the things post the financial uh, crisis uh, was the balance sheet uh, of a lot of the banks who were being thinned, and therefore there was room for private credit uh, to step into that space. So the, you know that that was attractive. The work that we're doing on renewables, that is uh, another aspect. So in addition to comparing the numbers, it is to see if there are insights and ideas that we can glean and incorporate, uh, and then uh, uh, and discuss that, uh, present that uh, to our clients uh, to further that. Uh, discussion. Um, maybe I, I will. I will add to uh, Amit's comment. Um, we we always very aware and focus what's up here is um, Canada or global. It's it's doing. Um, I guess the the asset mix of the Heritage Trust Fund. Uh, we can always uh, compare ourselves to the other uh, Maple peers. Uh, CPP and other pension fund, um, and I, I, I would say um, the the performance, especially last year, uh, I, I don't have the long-term performance has been uh, compared 
pretty much very favorably. But sometimes it needs to be mindful of different reporting cycle, uh, December year end, March year end. Um, uh, some of the fund have August year end. And also, it's still difficult to get to the fine detail of the fund asset mix. Uh, probably you can read on the annual report on the asset mix. However, a lot of differences within the fund, uh, such as the use of leverage, uh, the currency policy, hedging versus no hedging, it's a lot of moving parts to exact compare of the apple versus oranges comparison. One of the comparison we use a lot is called the CEM survey that compare of the global uh, uh, fund endowment or pension fund out there. Um, that include uh, uh, quite a big universe size of different style of pension and endowment fund. We look at the fund performance over a longer term, less so on tenure. The fund performance tend to be top quartile relative return, tend to be around 70 basis point net of fee. And so that gives us some of the guideline if the, the, the reasonableness of 100 basis point is probably within the range that it's, it's reasonable with the CEM survey. And so those are a, a lot of different reference points we point to. But again, the, 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 the trick of, of, of challenge of comparing that is the actual, uh, um, uh, the uh, other type of uh, investment activities such as leverage and currency is which is more challenging to understand uh, beyond the annual report you can get from a public info. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go on to MLA Williams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and if it's all right with you, I'm probably going to leave my camera off. I've had connectivity difficulties. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about um, the, how the report explains that the, the fund is Alberta's primary long-term savings vehicle, and I want to talk about that in relation to inflation. So the report indicates that the ministry set a, a real return expectation for the fund equal to 4.5% greater than the inflation rate over five years. So my question is, can you explain how the Heritage Trust Fund has fared over the last five years compared to the real return target? So uh, during the last five years, uh, the Heritage Fund has earned 7.6%. Inflation has been approximately 1.9%, I believe, um, leaving a benchmark, if you will, or an, a nominal return uh, target of 6. Pardon me, four percent, and uh, and so we've outperformed that target by one point two percent. What challenges do you see in the next five years with inflation, uh, the rate it's at now, in terms of being able to meet that target? Well, inflation, an inflationary environment, is a, a difficult investment environment, and. Uh, you know, if you look back at the 70s and 80s, uh, the last time that Canada and much of the world uh, faced high inflation, you will see that uh, equity returns, among other things, uh, were not very good. Uh, fixed income returns eventually were good with extremely high interest rates. But uh, if you were on the other side of that trade before they went up, uh, you lost a lot of money on fixed income. Uh, so um, it will be a challenge, um, depending on how long uh, inflation sticks around and uh, how severe it is. Um, it's one of the reasons we have a significant uh, allocation to inflation-sensitive assets uh, is precisely to protect future Albertans, if you will, uh, and the income that future Albertans will rely on. Uh, so so it, it, if inflation hits uh, and is significant. Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to MLA again. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, and um, we seem to have a theme around inflation, which of course um, is affecting affordability for for everyone um, in this province and, and uh, further afield. Um, I, I would also like to ask um, around the risks to um, in 
uh, the, the uh, portfolio in regards to inflation. Um, you, uh, in your report, you write that uh, performance, I quote, uh, performance with in these asset classes expect to be challenged in the following quarters as further interest rates hikes are li likely. Um, so I, I'm just reading this is that you only expect interest rate hikes over a relatively short term um, for a few quarters. Um, other people uh, uh, speculate otherwise. So if I can ask just directly, when are you projecting to see the Bank of Canada's overnight rate hitting a peak? and when, and at what level do you see uh, Canada's inflation rate peaking, and when? I know this is speculative, but, uh, you know, I bet you you thought mm. about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll give it a try. That's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so, currently the general front-end rate, or the overnight rate, is about... 1.5% in Canada, probably 2% in the state, because the U.S. has been more aggressive hiking interest rate. Uh, Bank of Canada will be next, coming up. Usually the market expectation will be more aggressive this time, 50 basis point to 75 basis point. That's what priced in. Um, central Bank, no doubt, is it's right now they are fighting inflation. Their mission of the central bank, they have said it loud and clear. It's one mission, they have to put inflation under control. So central bank will be very aggressive for the next little while to make sure inflation come under control. However, again, sometimes in the inflation scenario we are having here is supply shock inflation. For central bank coming in using monetary policy is more pushing demand to drive inflation lower. So driving the demand lower and even trying to increase unemployment rate to slow down the economy, driving down inflation. Now for the question is how far the interest rate can go or it will probably go. It's a tricky question because right now the market thinks, well, 2.5%, 3% 3 is the terminal rate. It's usually the stabilized rate. You can bring inflation down and stabilize the, uh, the job market. However, it doesn't look like inflation is under control because a second supply shock because of the Russian Ukraine and the energy crisis. So central banks need to be more forceful. Now, the, the, the new estimation is maybe central bank will need to go to 4% in, in the front end. There is a risk to come along with it and the central bank aware that they need to be very mindful. Just because of the 3% and even going to the 4%, you are really running a risk of really bringing uh, recession coming to the economy. As simple as the Canadian market. Canadian, uh, Canadian market is really uh, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, um, a housing market driven. A big part of the Canadian economy, you can argue, is housing market consumer driven. By having inflation uh, or interest rate too high, too aggressive, too fast, to 4%, it will have a very negative impact on consumer. So with that in mind, that uh, consumer always, um, with, with the, the burden of a consumer on the housing market and the equity market correction, that's already cut in the wealth effect of consumer. Higher interest rate will also have more burden on the mortgage for the, uh, for the consumer. And the consumer also feeling about the inflation impact already of high energy food courses that they, will, they are cutting into the spending uh, because of that. So my, my, my view is that does the central bank need to go all the way to 4%? Not necessarily. By having the, uh, the interest rate probably at a three and three and a half handle, probably it can do enough to slow the economy because of the consumer behavior. To slow down the economy, maybe bring down inflation gradually. The trick and the challenge of the central bank is how fast inflation will come down. If there are more external shock coming our way and the central bank need to go harder. But if everything is still priced out <coughs> as is where we are right now, no more external uncertainty, um, I think and I hope inflation will show some improvement at year end. And then central bank aggressively hiking interest rate right now because interest rate will usually take 12 months to kick in. So by that time, um, the economy effect will be more uh, 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 observed in the market. 
And if there is no more exogenous event or geopolitical event, then hopefully inflation will come back down and control at year end. Then central bank will be taking the, the, the foot off the gas pedal a little bit on hiking uh, uh, interest rate. I hope I answer your uh, million dollar question. No, no, I thank you. And um, there's a couple of insights there that uh, I think all of us need to be mindful of. Um, first, that increases to um, the uh, central bank's uh, um, interest rates uh, take time to uh, demonstrate their effects, right? So we have we can't uh, be too hasty in, in our judgment. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I know that uh, inflation um, is uh, now projected at 7.7% based on Statistics Canada's last week uh, information. Um, and I did also note that our um, government of Alberta is still uh, predicting inflation at roughly 3%. So I, obviously they have to make an adjustment. Perhaps they will do so this morning when they have their um, um, fiscal update. I hope they do anyway to reflect reality. Um, but uh, my question, my follow-up question is back to AIMCO. Of course, of course, you are a long-term investor and, um, you know, inflation doesn't look that transitory. Um, so um, what uh, are you doing? You've already sort of answered this first part um, to mitigate uh, against the risk of higher inflation. But um, you did mention also in your answer to the first question that you would look to have some liquidity to take advantage of the situation. I'm just curious to know what, um, you know, what, uh, uh, where, where, where you might uh, go in regards to taking advantage of the uh, higher inflations uh, and some liquidity to make uh, investments for Albertans. <clears throat> yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, so there are actually with the asset of a correction, even for the last three months coming down aggressively, uh, we see some of the sector like um, different asset class is actually starting to present value. Uh, for as simple as a fixed income portfolio, shorter maturity, a very high quality investment grade liquid bond, it's, it's trading at a wider spread is actually presenting value. If you compare with the uh, where interest rate is right now, adding in the corporate spread, and maybe you can can buy an investment grade corporate pawn three years at 4%, it may not be a bad return after all. Yeah. And same for public equity. For the asset valuation, and there are a lot of sectors that have corrected significantly up to 30% already. Uh, some of the bigger uh, tech company or even bigger cap stock, they have a major correction already. And sometimes it presents value, especially for some of those companies have a more stable cash flow, can pass up the inflation and, and, and to the end user have a low volatility of operation margin and, 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 and stable gross margin. There are some good company exist out there um, for, 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 for provide providing opportunity. Now, in terms of the private side, it is actually interesting on the other uh, end of the spectrum. Inflation actually, um, uh, with the, the, the risk off event, um, for a lot of investors having the appetite to, to have risk on, off, and it provides a lot of secondary, even private uh, investment. There, you, there are a lot of interesting opportunity on secondary private equity, secondary private credit, just because there are investors on the other side maybe uh, having less, liqu uh, less liquidity, need liquidity, and more looking for a sale of some of the higher quality. So we are keeping focus even sometimes on the secondary market, even in the private market to look for uh, some of the opportunity. The other opportunity we are looking for is different geographic region. There are major disbursement of the economic recovery in different region. It developed market, emerging market, Asian market. The recovery path and the asset valuation will be significantly different across different regions. So for AIMCO being global and looking for a diversified uh, opportunity around the world, there are some pocket of value in different regions of the market is starting to present value. So just give you some example of uh, some of the opportunity we are looking at. I'll just slide in um, one quick comment. So. Uh, one of the lens we we bring to a portfolio such as yours is to again balance the near with the longer term, and uh, uh, and so for example uh, this morning the ten year uh, 
break even of the inflation expected inflation rate in the U.S. is running at around two and a half percent. That's where that that security is trading, if you will. Yeah. And another fact to it is uh, you're able uh, another security that trades uh, that market participants utilize is a five-year inflation, five-year forward. That number is running around two uh, two and a quarter at the moment. And therefore, uh, many of the opportunities that present ourselves to ourselves in the short term, relative to you know where the longer term um, uh, outlook is, getting that getting that right is again something uh, that we bring to bear on portfolios such as uh, such as yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll carry on with MLA Singh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to extend my uh, appreciation for the presence of the representative from Ministry of Finance and AMCO. And I see on page 10 that private equities comprised 8.7% uh, of the fund in March 2020-21, but had increased to 9.4% uh, in March 2022. In this has been the main change I see on the chart. Uh, and why did MCO decide to increase the percentage of private equities and decrease the assets of the emerging market from 4.5% to 3.5%? Um, thanks, thanks for the question. So um, in terms of equity exposure, um, uh, uh, correctly so um, that the private equity exposure actually increased um, versus the emerging market equity. Um, two reasons I will address. Uh, number one is, as you aware, the performance of private equity is extremely strong. Um, so and and also emerging market of the equity have a negative return. As such, just because of the asset of going higher in private equity versus emerging market is a drop in asset valuation, um, that prorotally reflect the changes uh, from 2021 to 2022. Second reason is also is as part of the intent and the, uh, um, uh, the way we want to position the portfolio itself. Private equity has always been a very strong asset class we focus on and that we like and favor. Uh, private equity is an investment in the, um, in the asset that a um, uh, 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 private company and uh, some of the asset class we focus a lot such as IT, consumer, healthcare being the top three asset classes. Those are the asset classes that uh, we expect in general a higher return versus is public equity over a long run. We have this program for a long time that uh, we like the growth potential for the underlying company, especially for the INCO approach, how we manage this asset. We always team up with very strong partnership out there, and we always have co-investment, direct investment, and through our due diligence and our impact of the portfolio company together with our partner, we can always create a lot of good value in this asset classes away from a traditional public equity investment. So this is a good asset class that we always like, we always want to grow, and for indeed for the last two uh, last year is actually a strong demonstration of how strong this program has been generating a 37 percent return like the asset I, I share with you Hayward which is um, a, 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 a century old uh, swimming pool company when we bought that a long time ago five years ago we did not know COVID is happening. But just because of COVID, work from home is actually give us a six times multiple of a return because the company going IPO. Um, the other investment that we have is actually worth mentioning is an asset we call ERM, Environmental uh, uh, Resources Management. That is, um, uh, we sold this asset to uh, private equity firm KKR. Um, uh, ERM is the world's largest pure play sustain, uh, sustainability consultancy with uh, operation over 40 countries and 5,000 partners out there. Again, just because of we are early and identified this opportunity, it's allowed us to um, uh, harvest a very handsome return for this type of investment. Our exit is close to two times multiple for, for this type of investment. 
Now, on the private equity side, this is NASDAQ class we continue to like. Last year, we demonstrate this is a strong program, especially. In terms of the emerging market on public equity, it's a challenging backdrop. Uh, over the last year, especially with high inflation, the challenge in developed market and, and even the global markets, such as China, High U.S. dollar, this is always the traditional backdrop that is the least favor for emerging market. So as such, we proactively actually tilt away from emerging market at the same time. So like as you see on the the, the changes on those two sub-asset class is, uh, is an approach, uh, part of our active management, and also reflecting the valuation changes as well. Thanks for answering here. In, uh, on page 13, I see that under fixed income, uh, there are 61% assets on Canadian uh, public fixed income, 19% of private mortgage, 17% of private debt and loan, and 3% of cash assets. Can you explain the performance of fixed income investments in each asset category under this class? Um, sure. So within fixed income, we actually have three sub-asset class. Uh, what we describe as public fixed income, private mortgages, and private credit, or what we call private debt and loan. Uh, each of the asset class uh, um, uh, uh, performed differently during last year. Public fixed income, which is more focused on uh, um, high quality government bond and corporate bond, um, we actually delivered the performance of a slightly under, uh, underperformed the benchmark by about 20 basis point. Um, the portfolio has been more disciplined approach focusing on high quality short maturity credit. Um, focusing on uh, shorter duration bets. And as such, over the last year, despite a challenging backdrop of fixed income rates environment, the team managed to more hugging the benchmark, delivering a benchmark return. In terms of private mortgages, um, it's invested in commercial mortgages um, that, that we have. It's a diversified pool of global uh, 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 mortgages in Canada and opportunistic basis in US and Europe. Um, this is a pool that, again, is focusing on very high quality mortgages, and but the most of the value add of the mortgages is actually uh, coming from um, the, the short duration. We kind of focus on a shorter maturity of the mortgages. The performance of the mortgages pool is flat, close to zero. However, this strategy outperformed the benchmark by close to 3.4%. Last but not least is our private credit portfolio. This is a portfolio similar to the private equity book that we like to grow. It's, it's a very strong asset class. The, the asset class is focused on floating rate. So floating rate investment is not sensitive at all to, 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 to interest rate. So it's actually give us a very good performance to start with. And also the team has been very disciplined on how we invest. We've invest on a very strong cash flow asset. Uh, it's a very diversified pool on different asset class, leverage financing, structure credit, and, and fund financing. And uh, and the, 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 the discipline of this fund is actually demonstrated even over the last year is more challenging environment. <laughs> we have close to zero loan loss into, into this type of portfolio. So the program actually deliver at 8.7% over last year, strongly outperforming the benchmark. So for the mix of the fixed income mix for those three asset classes jointly actually contribute a very strong outperformance despite the, uh, a challenging negative backdrop of the rates environment. Thank you, I appreciate the answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, our uh, next uh, question will come from MLA Gray. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd just like to uh, continue along the lines <clears throat> from my last question. And thank you very much for the, the responses that were provided. Um, you spoke about uh, the CAM survey, uh, the comparison uh, to other peers. Thank you, peers was a better word than uh, competitors um, within the, the sphere. And I believe uh, that you referred to having some of those comparisons in the short term, but, but not the long term comparisons available for us here. Um, looking at uh, the CEM 
kind of information. It doesn't appear that it's it's easily and publicly uh, available for me as a member of this committee to review and to better understand. Um, certainly not here at this meeting, but would it be possible to, to get more information about those comparisons? Uh, and it may be something we might need to go in camera for. Like, I don't know if you're allowed to publicly share that, but as a member of the committee, I'd, I'd like to better understand those comparisons. We'll take that as a way, as a follow-up item, and then revert to the committee. Perfect. And you're right, uh, we'll also just confirm what is in public domain and what we're able to share, but to the extent we're able to, absolutely. That, I would appreciate that. I think that would be great. Um, and then looking uh, for more information uh, it, uh, during the questioning, um, and looking up the, at some of the work CEM has done, uh, I am looking at the Global Pension Transparency Benchmark Project, uh, which has run in 2021 and now 2022. Um, and one of the things it f focuses on is evaluating um, the performance uh, and transparency uh, across global uh, offerings and investment firms uh, with a strong focus on uh, well, many different factors, but the one that jumped out to me was governance. So in our Heritage Savings Trust Fund uh, section, page six on governance, very high level, just referencing kind of the legislation. Uh, but when it comes to governance, uh, we're aware that you've had a lot of changeover with your executive team. Uh, there's a new CEO. You're looking at your five-year strategy review. Uh, and so my, my question for you would be, uh, I think we will find more of that information in the AIMCO annual report, which I don't believe is out yet. Um, is the AIMCO annual report, which I think does influence kind of the Heritage Savings Trust Fund and provides more detail, um, when do you anticipate publishing that and will we see more uh, improvements in that transparency, those governance disclosures in this year's annual report? Is that uh, in line with some of the, the new strategic focus uh, that you've been telling us about here today? So, uh, the... Uh the uh, annual report is will be published uh, imminently, and so you'll see uh, you know see see all the details uh, that we've uh, done uh, historically. The the desire uh, uh, and our focus is to continue to become more transparent, not only in the annual report, but in our uh, multilateral uh, bilateral engagements uh, with clients and other stakeholders. So that's the direction that we are firmly uh, committed to and the direction uh, we're uh, going in. And then lastly, uh, to the extent there are uh, still areas that we could share with, uh, with clients, again, happy, happy to add to those, uh, again, on a bilateral basis or more comprehensively at the, at, at the annual report. Thank you. Uh, next on the question list is MLA Rain. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all the members who've attended this morning and for answering our questions and enlightening us. I want to talk about the different challenges the world has been facing the last two years. How did the pandemic impact the fund's performance over the last year, and has the fund recovered from these impacts? You want me to take it? Well, uh, I'll, I can take that at least to start. Uh, the last year has been very good, and the pandemic, uh, I think one of the results that we've seen in the market is is the economy has come back much stronger than, than expected. Uh, there were negative results in the first year of the pandemic, certainly, um, but uh, most of those have been... Uh, 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 recovered, if not exceeded by now. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, no, I, I, I concur. Uh, the pandemic impact, it's, it's, it's probably uh, uh, less, less, less so and, uh, in the, the last year. And it's actually, uh, which continues to have the good performance at low uh, demonstrated, even on last year return and this year return, they have been always a uh, positive return. And the residual pandemic impact, it's really still remain. And probably as you can see in the first three months of 2022 is China. 
um, the pandemic and the COVID impact is is resurfacing in China, and it's it's more the second derivative of pandemic. Uh, when there is a pandemic event in in China, uh, further lockdown, zero COVID policy in China, and leading to Again, going back to the inflation question, it's the inflation impact. So I would say now the 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 pandemic impact is is less so on on being impacted, but is more how the world cover from inflation, how we recover from the supply chain challenge, and now the next wave of the geopolitical event that we are seeing. And just to add a bit of color in terms of uh, in terms of how it's impacted uh, the portfolio, for example. So clearly, the pandemic, you know, uh, goes without saying, big, big human uh, tragedy, and has impacted uh, uh, everyone across the board um, uh, in a, in a in a difficult difficult manner. But the types of things, types of investments that have done well. So think about. Uh, the move, uh, the huge move towards e-commerce, Amazon and the others. And so the investments in logistics distribution centers, for example, those types of, uh, you know, those types of investments have been attractive for the portfolio. Uh, Sandra talked about Hayward Swimming Pool, you know, good solid company, but all of a sudden because of the, uh, because of the work from home, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that did really, really well. So all of that to say that clearly, uh, obviously, it's difficult uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a personal, on a, on a, on a people front. But the, there are pockets of opportunities within the portfolio, within the investment uh, universe that that are attractive, notwithstanding uh, the pandemic. All right. Um, I was also wondering what strategies did Ainco implement to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. And how has the Russian-Ukraine conflict impacted the fund's performance, if it has at all? Um, I would go for the second question first on the Russian in Ukraine. The, the unfortunate event of Russian Ukraine happening during February of earlier on. Um, Inco really have minimum exposure to Russia or Ukraine. Um, so we only have probably less than 100 million exposure, uh, more through the passive index portfolio that we have. That is, if you own the index, you will own part of the exposure because Russia is within the index. That's only account for about 15 basis point of the public equity or even less, and six basis point of the total fund. IMCO has a full discipline approach and when look at contrary risk in assessing the risk. And as such, we have no exposure direct to, to Russia. So that there is a, a minimum exposure of, 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 of that. And indeed for Russian and Ukraine situation, <clears throat> pardon me, that we have been proactively aware of the risk of the geopolitical event and, and the risk potentially coming to the market. And we have been proactively positioning ourselves and being less overweight or actually underweight in stock because we know if there even happened, there is a risk equity market will sell off. And we will be uh, uh, more also um, uh, cautious with the, um, with the uh, uh, fixed income exposure as well. Um, so those are the, the, the exposure of, of Ukraine and Russia that we don't have uh, exposure to. But again, to the other exposure that we have is, is through Russia and Ukraine, the, the globalization risk, inflation risk, the energy risk, those different aspects have different impact to the portfolio in terms of the energy sector, inflation rates, again, risk asset. And AIMCO approach is, is a, a top-down, bottom-up approach that makes sure we have a diversified portfolio to, 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 to handle and mitigate the risk, diversified in strategy, constant stress test, and a lot of those risks we, we actually put on extra uh, uh, monitoring process. As simple as the Russian-Ukraine situation, we constantly think of who are the second and third derivative of the exposure of a country or company may have exposure and, and to, to Russian-Ukraine. 
We constantly in touch with all our counterparty we do business with to see if they have Russia and Ukraine situation. And last but not least, we are very mindful again with, with the counterparty risk, the, all the party we trade with, and the overall liquidity condition. So those are the, a lot of different actions we have taken during the March time. And AIMCO actually took a proactive step that on March 1, we have uh, we have shared that we will be taking proactive step that we will be divesting from Russia uh, if the condition permitted. So we actually also took a step to declare that we, we also divest from Russia. And we are one of the first couple pension funds to do so. Finish up, but then uh, I've got three short questions, and I'll just uh, start. Then, how how are high world oil prices um, impacting the fund? So, a higher oil price can impact the fund in different way, and maybe I will just describe it in a higher level. The direct impact will obviously to the energy sector. Um, I think for the higher uh, oil prices, probably it will be a, 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 a very positive tailwind for the energy sectors or even commodity related sectors or industry. So that's, that's one of the uh, uh, um, uh, impact that will be a positive tailwind for the direct exposure. Secondly, for uh, a fund like Heritage Trust Fund that have uh, a Canadian exposure and currency exposure in Canadian dollar, stronger energy implies stronger for Canada and Canadian dollar. As such, by looking at Heritage Trust Fund, uh, still quite a lot of exposure, especially on currency Y in US dollar and Canadian dollar. Um, that's it's actually positive for the fund because with the Russian Ukraine situation, it's lead to a lot of currency depreciation in a lot of different regions. But Canadian dollar, US dollar holding very strong with that. So that is actually a, a good impact for, for the fund. Um, the third derivative of it, again, I, I may sound like a broken record, um, it's, it's, it's how it impacts inflation. So those, I, I'm not going to repeat the script again, but it's, it's the, th the different layer of direct and indirect uh, exposure that we are very mindful on how we impact the fund. All right. Then just to wrap things up, um, have they affected any Alberta energy holdings in particular? And has there been a shift in appetite for energy investments? Um, and I think our thesis of energy investment stays the same. When we look at the energy investment, this is obviously a very good tailwind on the energy investment. And um, But our thesis is more or less the same. When we invest for the client, we look at the best risk adjust return for the client uh, is, is return focus. And when we look at any asset in different sector, you name it, it's based on two things. Does it fit our client on risk and return appetite? Does it fit for the, the product? So I think um, our, our strategy and on energy per se related doesn't, doesn't change much because our ultimate focus is the best risk adjust return that we identify identify opportunity for decline in different backdrop, to be honest. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will go on to MLA again. Um, well, thank you, Chair. Um, and um, I, I would just like to ask uh, about um, one of the asset classes um, that um, maybe wasn't doing quite as well. Um, the, uh, what AIMCO characterizes as a strategic opportunity. And so, um, this year, I'm seeing, correct me if I'm wrong, strategic opportunity class had a negative 9.8% return um, versus the uh, positive uh, for the overall benchmark. So um, that's quite a significant uh, differential. Um, so and uh, probably brings down your overall number. It could have even been better without the strategic opportunity uh, negative number. So um, you over the past five years, your return 5.4 percent of the benchmark, again compared to 10.2 overall. So it's 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 quite a significant mix. So I I'm just want to ask first of all what for the sake of uh, everyone watching, um, what do you mean by strategic opportunities, and um, how does uh, strategic opportunity uh, uh, deals um, form um, uh, as part of your management? Um, I 
will address that. Uh, strategic investment is actually a very, very small exposure within Heritage <coughs> Bond, uh, probably close to even less than 50 basis points. Those are the, uh, uh, the, the residual or some of the earlier on investment on the uh, very early uh, activity that INCO had. And as I recall, this is as early as probably um, 10 years ago or even seven, eight years ago, that those are the asset invested early on as um, venture capital and some of the relationship investment that we no longer invested for a longer period of time. So those are basically the, the residual of assets that we no longer invest in those asset class. It's more the asset we need to wait to, to play it out, but we continue to manage and monitor the performance on those assets. So those are the, 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 uh, the asset uh, that we have in the strategic opportunity that, that we are no plan to, to to continue to, to add to that particular asset class. So your plan is not to add to it, but <clears throat> maintain that that space? We will maintain and actively manage the, the, the asset as, as we invested, and either through the, the um, uh, uh, different way of exit or manage the asset um, of, of, of selling or, or different type, uh, different market condition to wind down on that portfolio. Oh, wind hold. down, okay. Okay, great, thank you. So they're in runoff mode, so to speak. Sorry, go ahead. They're in runoff mode, so to speak. Right, okay, yeah. thank you. <coughs> That's it. I can carry on with another question. Oh. Yeah, we've, we've we have no more questions on our side at this point. So. Oh, much appreciated. This is great. Um, so I'd like to ask about risks to the fund uh, and some of the issues you outline on page 13 of the annual report. Uh, around private debt, you write, and I quote, investments in private debt and loans consist of specialty loans and financing for corporations that do not meet the requirement of other financing structures and methods, which I think, if I've understood correctly in plain language, just means uh, lending money to corporations who are having trouble raising capital uh, and we're having trouble raising capital when real interests have been zero or negative. Uh, so potentially high-risk propositions. Um, and I note that 32.1% of this debt isn't even rated. So my first question in two parts is, uh, how concerned are you about rapidly increasing interest rates and their impact on these private debt placements? And if AIMCO decided to exit these positions today, would we be in a loss position or a gain position? Thanks for bringing it up. If I can, I, I will rewrite that sentence, actually, okay. um, because that's not the intent of private debt and loan and private credit. Um, indeed, that sentence probably means that that do not meet the requirement of other financial structure or method, meaning that it's not public. It's not issued in the public market. It's more issuing through the private market that it's, it's, it's not liquidly trade. However, is the private in nature like uh, all the other private investment. Uh, it also says it's, it does not meet the requirement of the other method. And probably is referring to all those assets doesn't come with a rating. Usually public trade, public credit is traded in the public market, come with a public rating. So I think that's the differentiate of the private credit. Um, it's only it's traded in, in it's, it's a private doesn't come with a rating, and but the underlying quality of it, I would say, is it's, it's a very high quality. Uh, the equivalent rating of that, we actually look at those assets, we apply internal rating when every single business, every single investment we invest, it's a range from probably uh, a double B to triple B and maybe some of the single B, but as you can see, because of the private in nature, you got compensated for that risk. So it's, it's, it's actually very high quality. The, the other um, uh, uh, metric of the quality of that uh, of that pool is by the um, of the um, uh, 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 leverage multiple. Uh, leverage multiple for this type of pool is usually very low, um, three to, to five times multiple, depends on the asset. So the whole asset of, of investing in this asset is because of private in nature. It's give you extra premium compared with the public credit market. And those are the market is not you can find in the public market. And some of the issue are coming to that market is you cannot find in the public market. It's actually it's a good way to diversify on the uh, performance, 
diversify on the underlying issuer and diversifying on the uh, 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 underlying structure. Um, so a lot of the underlying asset is actually sponsored by a strong private equity firm, um, all the good private equity firm you know about. Um, the purpose of this fund, uh, one third of it is to, to provide uh, liquidity to the private equity firm to do buy out on some of the private equity asset that you saw. And the other thing is the um, uh, structure finance and net financing. Again, those are the space that usually um, uh, 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 not easily tap with public market, but this is the space you can go compete with a, a lot of uh, bank out there, look for interesting private opportunity. Okay. So the the quality is high in, in this. Uh, the how I, I interpreted that sentence is, is maybe not how it's being used. Um, these are sponsored by private equity firms. I think that, okay, that gives me a little bit more confidence in what's happening with this, so I appreciate that. Uh, but the, the second part of my question was just around with, with increasing interest rates or maybe just understanding um, when we have these uh, investments that uh, don't have those ratings, uh, how do you stress test that, that portfolio, especially in the environment of higher interest rates going on, um, and mm. how do you manage that risk uh, given it's, it's of a private nature? Do you still have access to the same amount of information you might have had for a public asset? Yeah, we, we do. Uh, uh, two things. Um, each of the asset, we have all the detailed information the, the financial statement and the balance sheet. And we also have each of the asset, we have good info from the underlying issuer we lend money to. That's the difference on the, on, on the public asset. Um, so with that, um, the team have good access to assess the risk on a regular basis. This is also um, uh, constantly evaluated by the risk team as well. So each each year um, that we, we we underwrite the book to reassign the rating to make sure looking at the balance sheet market backdrop macro environment that we reassign the internal rating and make sure it reflects the quality that that uh, is of the whole book is moving in the direction and exhibiting the risk and return behavior that we are looking for one uh, thing to just add for perspective it is in space, uh, in a space like this, that a fund such as the Heritage, Heritage Trust Fund and other institutional investors uh, have a leg up compared to the many of the other investors in that the horizon is longer and there is, at the margin, more appetite uh, to participate and, and liquid. So all else equal to the extent that there is a lot less competition, if you will, competing for the same, same deal. You know, that's attractive, and you can, in geek speak, harness that risk premium that comes with uh, these types of investments. The second thing, again, by way of context, why this space came up is if you look at the data from 30, 40 years ago, a lot of the lending uh, would happen by the banks, and this is effectively the banks uh, streamlining the balance sheet and the private credit uh, 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 participants stepping in to uh, provide that credit and therefore uh, uh, exploit those opportunities. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we got about three three minutes left. So. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, just quickly ask about um, your an equity holding. Um, in a supplemental question, I'll ask about a uh, foreign equity, but uh, first I just want to focus on Canada. One of the larger uh, stakes uh, you have is in, in uh, Shopify. It's, you're an active manager. So you're not just buying the equities, um, and uh, I just uh, see that uh, year to day Shopify is down mm -hmm. over 70%, and it's the kind of stock that tends to do poorly as interest rates rise. And so in this context, can you share with the committee your views on uh, a, a large holding like this and where you expect it to go? And you can always answer that, you know, in writing if you want. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we will, we will provide our response in writing together with the uh, other feedback we provide. Okay, I, yeah, because we're, we're tight on time. So, um, and, you know, just to follow up, uh, when interest rates uh, rise, uh, uh, cash flows are less valuable, right, typically. And so in terms of uh, equity portfolios, that means that increased interest rates, environments, uh, you would expect uh, tech stocks to do 
comparatively poorly. Um, but when we read uh, the, rep your, uh, the report here on page 17, we can see the global equity portfolio and your top seven holdings are tech stocks. So again, you know, um, INCO, as I understand it, is not an um, index fund, so you're not just buying into the market. Can you um, share why the fund's top holdings are aggressively in technology stocks, um, particularly as interest rates are uh, increasing um, imminently and consistently? And again, you can just answer that um, in writing, please. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we will do so. I suspect this is more about the um, the passive side, like more replicating the benchmark. But we will come yeah, back with sure. the Sure, okay, response. yeah, no, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Sure. My uh, question is out of uh, the initial report in that, that you gave, Mr. Prakash, um, and you were talking about uh, improvements in interacting with clients, uh, and you referred to working forms. Uh, and I just, uh, I was curious, what do you mean by working forms for interacting with clients? Um, it was in your report, and you had just finished talking about meeting and understanding the investment requirements and the risk portfolios. And I heard the language working forms, and I wondered if that meant everything is in writing now or how this mechanism is improving things. Maybe I was referring to working from home. Sorry, I <laughs> garbled, garbled my <laughs> words. Um, um, I'm looking at my notes to see if I was referring to something else. Okay. Working uh, from home, sorry. Yeah, not oh, yeah, not all working right, forms. So yeah. I misunderstood yeah. that. I appreciate that. Uh, well, then, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions, then I'll call for a motion to approve, approve the Alberta Heritage uh, Savings Trust Fund 2021-2022 annual report. And I see MLA Allard has a motion ready. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move exactly what you said, that the Standing Committee on the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund approved the 2021-2022 draft annual report. Okay, any discussion on the motion? No? Okay, uh, all in favor, either online or in person, say aye. 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 Anyone? Aye. Aye. Any, aye. Okay, anyone opposed either in either location, say nay. Okay, that motion is carried. Uh, now we'll carry on with the rest of our business. Uh, you can stay and listen if you want, or you can head out if you got something else to do. Uh, but I appreciate you guys uh, coming, and uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Okay. So now, relative to the annual public meeting, we'll talk about date, location, and format uh, here uh, under Section Six Four um, D of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund Act, the committee is required to hold an annual public meeting to inform Albertans about the status of the fund. This meeting has traditionally been held in October before the start of the fall sitting of the assembly. And it's held in the evening hours from 7 to 9 p.m. However, the committee is not beholden to this in order for the LOA staff to begin preparations. Uh, the committee will need to decide on a date, location, and format. To follow the usual practice of holding an evening meeting prior to the start of the fall session, the committee would, could consider Thursday, October 27th, 2022 from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Edmonton Federal Building. Uh, do members have any questions or comments relative to this date and time? Anywhere? Online? No? Okay. <clears throat> we should also discuss the appropriate format for the meeting. Last year, due to the closure of the committee room galleries, uh, in-person participation of the public was not possible. Now the galleries open again and members can uh, attend in person. However, allowing public participation through a variety of methods, such as telephone, email, Twitter, Facebook, uh, that we have had in recent years, has been an effective way to hear from Albertans. So therefore, I would like to suggest uh, that in addition to members of the public attending the upcoming public meeting in person, the committee continue to accept questions by telephone, email, or social media. So these points of mind, I would like to uh, open the floor discussion on that part, if there's any. Are there any objections? Okay. All right. Uh, given that, 
Oh, sorry. Did someone have some? Oh, I'm no, no, sorry. no objections. Just right. uh, agreement that having maximum ability for Albertans to participate, and uh, yeah. that October twenty seventh seems, seems uh, yeah. like a reasonable because session is intended to to begin again the, the following Monday, right? So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will uh, now need uh, a member to move a motion to set the date and time of the meeting. And MLA Singh has a motion ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move a motion that the Standing Committee on the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund hold the 2021 public meeting at the Edmonton Federal Building and decide on the date and format at the committee's net, next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, uh, I... So that, that motion uh, was to decide on the date and format at another time? Is that the motion? Yeah, well, no. It, just, uh, I'd uh, like to consider, uh, in order to give communications an opportunity to um, uh, start to plan, if we could set a date and time, like October 27th from 7 to 9, like we had discussed uh, a bit earlier, if that's okay. A friendly, uh, what do you do with that? Does that need an amendment? Or a just a clarification. Okay. Would that be okay, MLA Singh? Uh, that would work for us. Thank you. Okay. Reread the motion. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll get uh, the clerk to reread the motion. Make sure it's okay for you, MLA Singh. Uh, so it would be moved, thank you, Mr. Chair. It would be moved that um, uh, Mr. Singh moved that the Standing Committee on the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund hold its annual public meeting on Thursday, October 27th, 2022, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. here at the Edmonton Federal Building. Is that okay, MLA Singh? Yep, thank you. Okay. Okay, any discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, all in favor, either online or in person, say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed, say nay. Okay, thank you. That is carried. Uh, communication plan. Turning to the communication plan. In years past, the committee has directed LOA Corporate Communications to prepare a communication plan in support of the public meeting and authorize the chair to approve the plan after it has been made available to members for a review. If members would like to take a similar approach this year, the committee could direct LOA uh, corporate communications to put together a draft communication plan, including cost information about the moder uh, about a moderated teleconference option. Once the plan is approved, the LOA could begin work on implementing the plan over the summer. Uh, we have Ms. Janet Laurie from LOA Corporate Communications joining us today. So if members have any questions, we could ask uh, Ms. Laurie to respond. Is there any questions relative to the communications? Go ahead, MLA again. Sorry, um, where's this person? Oh, she's online. Sorry. Okay, yeah. okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I, I could feel her presence. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, I'm just curious if you uh, have any ideas about um, you know, some variation on um, our uh, outreach plan for the public in regards to the uh, annual general meeting. Um, I know that uh, more people are talking about the Heritage Trust Fund than um, in the past. I've, I've noticed anecdotally, and um, I'm just curious if you have any ideas of how to reach uh, the a wider public more effectively. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Member Egan, and through the chair to you. Um, I think what we've tried to do traditionally is um, incorporate many different uh, communications channels to try to reach as broad an audience as possible. Um, we would definitely employ a similar approach this year, um, and that 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 comes back to the audience for this particular meeting being very diverse, and so wanting to reach out to people via traditional advertising, but also through social media using our website to promote the meeting um, and traditional media relations as well. So we would employ all of those different strategies um, to try and sort of cover as many audiences as possible. Um, and that also speaks to um, what you've already discussed as a committee today in terms of having the meeting um, actually take place um, with in person, if that's possible, using telephone, um, also 
accepting questions from the public via email and through social media during the meeting so that we can make it as engaging and accessible as possible for all Albertans. Just to follow up on that then, um, you know, I would encourage, um, as you said, all, all forms of media uh, in diverse uh, geographic areas as well so that we can uh, use uh, local papers, uh, you know, in uh, the regions uh, to have uh, traditional print ads. Um, I think that would be helpful, right, in, um, to make sure we're catching all regions um, in the province. Um, thank, thank you, Member Egan, and just through through you through the chair to you. Um, we typically advertise through Alberta's dailies um, to try to give the broadest reach uh, in terms of of those traditional print advertising, so that we do cover off um, diverse geographic regions throughout the province. But I'll certainly make a note that when we're looking at the plan this year, and we'll do some, we'll investigate some costs about um, potentially even including smaller. Um, uh, smaller papers because I think that's what you're referring to if I'm understanding correctly uh, but you know weeklies and um, so forth in smaller markets a lot of people read those papers right so there you yes. go thank you very much any other questions from anyone okay I think MLA Hunter has a motion prepared I do Mr. Chair um, I move that the Standing Committee on the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund direct LAO communication services to prepare a draft communications plan in support of the 2021-22 public meeting and that the chair be authorized to approve the communications plan after it has been made available for the committee to review. Okay uh, I don't think we have to have the 2021-2022 in there because it's just a meeting on that particular day so it would be just 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay, uh, MLA Hunter? Yeah. Sure, that's fine. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah, you betcha. Okay. Yeah. The clerk, uh, read this into the record for the record. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so it would be moved by Mr. Hunter that the Standing Committee on the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund direct LAO Corporate Communications to prepare a draft communications plan in support of the 2022 public meeting and that the Chair be authorized to approve the communications plan after it has been made available for the committee to review. Okay. All right, very good. Um, any discussion on that motion? All right, all in favor anywhere? Say aye. 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 Okay, any Aye. opposed uh, say nay. That motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, any other business for discussion today? Seeing none, uh, date of the next meeting. The date of the next meeting will be at the call of the chair, likely in September, which will review the first quarter of the, that just ended, will end here this week. Um, so we'll look that in September and look at any final things we want to do for the public meeting at that time. Uh, adjournment. Uh, if there's nothing else for the committee, we'll need a motion to adjourn the meeting. MLA Agan? Don't need a second here, right? No. All in favor anywhere, say aye. Aye. Any, aye. Any opposed, say nay. Okay, that's a wrap. Thank everyone for everyone's participation and good questions. Thank you. Thank you.